Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here uh, today to answer our questions. Since 2014, the Department of Homeland Security uh, and its, um, in particular, the Office of Inspector General at the Department of Homeland Security has been covertly auditing and inspecting security-related aspects of TSA, and it's done so, as far as I'm aware, about four times. The IG's findings have revealed some very alarming rates um, of failure, uh, of failure due to both human and technology-based failures. Most recently, in February of this year, the IG conducted covert testing on procedures to safeguard the so-called secure areas of airports, uh, finding both human-based and technology-based vulnerabilities at various points. And the IG made a series of six recommendations in response to uh, the perception of those failures. As of two months ago, each of the six recommendations made by the, AG, uh, by the IG were still open. Um, what can you tell us about the current status of the IG's recommendations, and when can we expect that those will be closed? Uh, we have concurred with all of the recommendation, individual recommendations and are actively working to address them. Uh, a number of these recommendations are ones highlighting some areas that we uh, also believe play into the larger discussion we are having around insider threat and the need to do more in insider threat. So not only are we looking to rapidly respond to those requirements, uh, we are also looking at what this tells us and how it informs our wider uh, recognition. We would be happy to provide you some additional um, discussion in perhaps a, a different setting as to some of the details of the requirement. Oh, thank you. You know, the, overall, we, we have seen this several times in the last few years. Do you, um, what do you feel about the overall trajectory of how it's going? Uh, overall, we believe that it's critically important that not only the Inspector General, but we ourselves do continual covert testing on our own programs and own processes. We look at not only how are we performing against the standards we set ourselves originally, you know, how we were set up to meet threats, are we meeting the threats we are set up for, but also as the threats changed, how are we positioned against those new threats, the ones we weren't designed to originally to meet? Thank you. I'd, I'd encourage you to do that. As you can imagine, um, there is a, a significant deprivation of a person's uh, privacy and, and liberty when a person is stopped along the way, and you know, most of the time, the way thing, these things work, the overwhelming majority of the people you're stopping, inconveniencing, and and uh, uh, people whose privacy is being violated are, are the innocent people. So um, in order to do that, we need to make sure that whatever we're doing is working and is done in the most minimally invasive uh, means possible. TSA has recently been collaborating with U.S. Customs and Border Protection um, over the testing of facial recognition technology. Can you tell me a little bit about what the TSA's timeline is for the widespread adoption of facial recognition technology, and um, uh, I, I'd also like to know what the TSA does when it collects this information. Does it collect it for any purpose other than as a verification for the purpose, uh, person's ID? Does it now or will it in the future uh, be keeping that data uh, uh, for any longer than is necessary uh, to perform the task at hand, or, or how long do they keep it? Um, so we are conducting two types of pilots. The first one, as you noted, is with Customs and Border Protection. The way that process works is uh, based on how many people who we think is going to be flying any individual day, based on who the carriers tell us have, have bought tickets, CBP helps pre-position a gallery of photos uh, of individuals whose passports are already on file, passport photos. As they approach a checkpoint, we are able to do a match against that smaller number uh, of parties. So we are not widely screening against large sets of data. We are looking for you to match you. The second type of pilot we are doing uh, just started recently out at McCarran uh, Airport in Las Vegas. That one, using our credential authentication technology, looks at matching you to the facial image on your driver's license or other document. Under both circumstances, we retain long enough to do the match for initial auditing, and then we are not storing. And in, in that sense, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, uh, until 2016, new TSOs often completed their training requirements at or near their home airports. 
it's my understanding that TSOs now receive uh, training at a centralized TSA academy located at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Georgia. Um, since this has happened, has TSA had any budget savings as a result of that? Uh, so, as you correctly note, we changed our process, and we've changed it slightly again in this past year. Uh, what we have done is, as a new TSO comes on board, they first are at their home airport for a period of time, about six months, and then they go off to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe. This l lets us go through an initial pr process and procedure to bring them on board, uh, continue to ensure that they are a good fit for the position that we are uh, tracking them for prior to undergoing the two-week training down in Glencoe. What we have seen coming out of the training in Glencoe is not as much a budgetary uh, savings, per se, as a consistency of training and camaraderie of spirit as people meet and retain those relationships across multiple airports. It enables them to know what another airport is doing against the same problem, as well as what their home airport does. Okay. I see my time's expired. Thank you very much.